the event because there is no other way to lawfully dissolve the guardianship. Now I'm going to walk through this document. And again, for anyone that is not clear where I've, I've, I've got this document from, this is one of the new documents added to the process of the Office of Executor. It's on one-heaven.org. It is under how to succeed at court, and it is on the link uh, Executor Office, and you call it up, you go now, and you'll see Decree of Nullity. So let's look through it quickly on the structure, because I've got another document to show you, and we've got money still to deal with. So on the Decree of Nullity, the first thing is, uh, as a decree, it is ultimately a, a judgment, and so we must show the first the form of action, and then the cause of action. So the, the form of action is what we have already presented, and that is the holy right, the holy writ of pronuntio restitutum, which is at the top, and that's what it describes. Uh, it doesn't have to show that you send it to every department. It doesn't have to be long-winded. It merely needs to show that a writ was issued, and it's the form of action that has led to this cause of action. Okay, so once that's at, the trust reference number is the court docket number, and then we go through. So let's go through what, what these elements are. Let's the opening paragraph. Let it be known and duly recorded that the valid Ecclesia Tribunal has hereby rendered any and all associated applications, contracts, oaths, and deeds associated between the parties of trust reference number blah, blah, null and void ab initio. Okay? So that's the act that nullifies any guardianship. It's dead. Now we give three reasons. First, neither the application nor any subsequent agreement was conducted in mutual good faith by all parties. Instead, the plaintiff bringing the controversy, as per the above-mentioned trust, was knowingly deceptive in order to obtain consent, and if the other parties had been aware of all the facts, would not have consented to the commercial union. Now, I know the words are very technical, but what you've just described is one of the fundamental reasons for an annulment of marriage. The guardianship for your home, your car, your property is, in fact, a form of civil marriage. It is a form of civil marriage where you are the feminine and they are the masculine. So to annul, one must refer in their system to the legitimate grounds for an annulment. And the first and most important legitimate grounds for an annulment is that both parties did not enter the agreement in good faith. Okay, number two. Second, the plaintiff bringing the controversy, as per the above mentioned trust, repeatedly engaged in unfaithful and clandestine behaviour with third parties through extra agreement relationships such as novations, assignments and conversion without valid disclosure nor any adequate compensation for such unfaithful actions against other parties. Again, sounds very technical, but let me explain what second basically means. It, it, it means infidelity. It means adultery. It's commercial adultery. Third, number three, the plaintiff bringing the controversy as per the above mentioned trust did not and does not have any right whatsoever to claim such powers as guardianship nor power of attorney as such powers were obtained through duress, threat and coercion via terms and conditions of the commercial union and not given freely without duress by the other parties. In other words, it was an arranged marriage. It was a forced marriage. It was a shotgun marriage. There's the three reasons. Now, please, it's ink thumbprints. It's not blood thumbprints. And if you don't have two people who are members, that's fine. They can sign. But that is a very powerful and a very important document, and it destroys, it annuls any claim of guardianship. Okay, time is against us. So let's move to the next one. The next document, which is revocation of power of attorney. 
I'm opening that up myself. Okay. So the revocation of power of attorney also gives three reasons. And it makes it very, very clear, very clear, that the powers of attorney have been revoked and the use of signature has been revoked. So I'm not going to read this one because of the time, but these are two very important documents that need to go with the executor because they destroy any counterclaim that the plaintiff, acting as the prosecutus, has any right, any right whatsoever, to bring the matter forward to the court. Well, that is some of, certainly um, a lot of the information. But I would like now to talk about money, truth and power about some of the other important insights that have come. And I hope the information that we've described tonight reinforces your confidence in what you're doing, provides further background and knowledge as to how they seem to still be resisting and how to deal with this area of guardianship which they refuse to give up. So let's talk about the second part, money, truth and power. And in, in light of the time, I will cut down some of the things I'll talk about, but I want to cover some, some pretty important ones, though. We use words, English words, and we look at them and we don't often think their true meaning. And one of those, for me, was the word treasure, is the word treasure. To a tr hidden treasure, I, like every young boy was fascinated by the concept of pirates and hidden treasure and going on treasure hunts and loved all that. But if you ask me to explain what the word really means and where it actually comes from, then in itself it's a treasure hunt that ends in blind alleys and, and uh, dead roads. What is clear though is that the word has great significance and that the word appears almost fully formed, appears fully formed certainly, around the same time that the apparatus we're talking about with our good old friends the Jesuits was being put into place. Well, before I answer this, let us look at one thing that we keep coming back to in their system, an understanding that they have, have always had, that the most valuable asset in the world the most valuable thing in the world is spirit, is the soul. Now, of course, in our world where we're worshipping money and silver and wealth and all kinds of temporal objects, we lose sight of this. But if you look at one theme, one constant in all of this, it is that their absolute desire to control, to own, to claim what they believe the most valuable property in the world, to collect that property, and that property being souls, soul collectors. Well, what is the definition of treasure, and what's the relevance to what we're talking about with money, truth, and power? It turns out the word treasure is yet another example of the College of Abbreviators and their successors, the Jesuits, creating a word out of a method that they created by using Latin words and instead of using the proper declensions at the end of Latin, replacing those with another Latin word to create new words. And treasure comes from four words. Tres, with the S removed, meaning three, trinity. As, or as, with the S removed, meaning bronze coins or coins of low value. Sub, or with the B removed, Su, meaning under, beneath, at the foot of, or close to. And Re, Re, property. So if we put those together, we get the following statement. Three bronze coins under or close to the property. Three bronze coins under close to the property. 
the meaning, the hidden meaning of treasure. Well, the first thing that you I hope you feel when you hear that is that's a very odd definition of treasure. What do they mean by three bronze coins placed under or close to the property? What does it mean? <clears throat> well, if I call the property the body, if I call the, the, the body the deceased body, and I go three bronze coins, have you ever heard of coins being placed on or in the body? I hope you have, because it's one of the oldest. In fact, it is the oldest, one of the oldest rituals dealing with deceased. Now, the Egyptians would place bronze or coins of low value, copper coins, on the eyes of the deceased and one in the mouth. And it was to pay the ferryman the fee, the usury, for the transport of the soul, the river sticks to the other side. It was the fee. Now, it was carried into Ch uh, Chiron, and the coins were called obol, when we look at Greece and Rome, and was considered a essential part of the funeral rites. And in places like Ireland and in Scotland, they still continue that ritual today. Three bronze coins, three copper coins, still today, as, a, as an ancient ritual. So what is the oldest ritual of the transmission of the soul dealing with treasure and this word coming out at the 16th century? Well, let me give you another word. Salvation. What does salvation mean? Well, salvation comes from salvus and ago, two words, salvus and ago. And again, using the College of Abbreviators, we cut off the, the back end of the Latin word and we, we create a new word. And salvus means without violation of the law, saved intact. And ago means to plunder, persecute, to do an act, to perform. So salvus, ago, or salvage means to plunder, persecute, do an act or perform without violation of the law. And salvage comes as the root of the word salvation. Key word promoted through evangelical, through Anglican, through all the Reformed churches was salvation. Salvage of the soul. So in treasure we see a reference to the oldest ritual the salvaging of the soul. And money playing an intrinsic part in that ritual. Coin. Temple, money, coins. Now last week we spoke of the meaning of bank coming ultimately from bar, unk. Bar meaning soul, personality and unk being the immortal life, Isis, Venus, Queen of Heaven. Or Luciferia, Lucifer. So Barank being the soul or the personality of Lucifer. But in the short time we've got left, and we will go a bit over time because this is important, I want to explain an important insight that even I did not fully appreciate. I've struggled, and I'm sure many people have struggled, to understand the relationship between private and public money. When we think of banks like the Federal Reserve, it is a private bank, private money. I don't know how many times people say that, and it's still the population that the powers that be would otherwise legally describe as idiots still don't get it. The Australian Reserve Bank is private. The, the Bank for International Settlement, the Bank of Banks, is private. It's all private banks. What I didn't understand is how old that system is and how intrinsic it has been in the relationship of commerce. Now, if we want to genericize the concept of public money, public money is any accepted means of exchange. The easiest public money, the oldest public money is barter. A goat is public money. A horse is public money. A home is public money. 
your sweat equity is public money.